get rid of the picture and then we can forget about it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I think I explained, I'm not a scientist by any means. You know, I have a, an interest in science mm -hmm. and a passion for science and also a passion to um, help scientists communicate their passion. And uh, so really that's what I'm trying to find out from you. So the basic question I ask, the first question I ask a scientist when I talk to them really is, if you were a songwriter, what would you want to express in song? What's the thing that most moves you about your work or excites you about the work? Or what's the thing that you find most frustrating that people don't understand about your work? It's oh, a, a difficult question. Yeah. First, I wouldn't know how to express it in a song. Well, that's why I'm I think here. <laughs> the, both the excitement, the passion, the frustration, the depth of understanding. For me, it doesn't come out in, in musical form. No, no. But, of course, you know maybe how to capture that yeah. and express it. That's what I'm music. interested in, yeah. But, yeah, I would because say... Because it seems to me that the scientists I speak, I, I meet, have just as much passion about their work as I have about my work. But it's, it's maybe harder to communicate to a general audience. Maybe, but I think science is about the thrill of discovery, mm -hmm. the thrill of learning new things. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes explain it in the following way, that a few centuries ago you could set sail and discover, well, first new continents, mm. then new islands, or new mountain ranges mm. hidden in the middle of a continent. Yeah. But now our whole globe has been mapped out. Yeah. There is nothing left to discover. In terms of terrain. In terms of terrain. Yeah. But in science, we can still it's make deep, discoveries. Deep discovering, yeah. We can uh, take matter to very low temperature. I just heard a talk about matter at trillion degrees Kelvin temperature. And there are very open questions. A happens. trillion degrees positive. Positive like, temperature. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so that takes us back very close to the conditions of the Big, Big Bang. Bang. Yeah. It's a soup of quarks, of yeah. elementary particles. Yeah. And uh, there are lots of open questions what will happen under those conditions. Right. So and it's is a that journey. It's a journey to into, discovery. Into, into, new, into ranges of new parameters. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where discoveries take place yeah. today. Yeah, because a, a year ago I was I was interviewing Sarah Seeger in that building up there, who is she's working on exoplanets, and she was saying very similar stuff, saying we're the explorers of the twenty first century. You know, there isn't there aren't places on Earth to discover, so we're going to other places to explore. And you're but you're staying on Earth but exploring what's here and trying to understand it. Well, my tool is the laboratory. Yeah. In, Across the hallway, we have several laboratories where we rig up equipment to reach new conditions, conditions for matter, for materials, which have not existed before. Now, is your, are you especially interested in superconductors, or was that not particularly your, your special interest? It's more... That a... is one special interest. Mm. It's one form of matter or one spectacular phenomenon in matter. Uh, which requires, well, it's super, it's interesting, yeah. but it also is deeply routed in quantum physics. Yeah. And for many years in my career, I studied uh, superfluidity, which is sort of the cousin of superconductivity. Right. Now, can you, this is horrible to ask you to do this, but can you give a, a, a layman's explanation, or an explanation for someone like me, of why superconductivity happens at those low temperatures? A simplified well, version? Yeah, well, I mean, if, if you assume you have many, many particles, and an analogy is you have many people who are in the streets of Boston. Right. And if it's crowded on a Saturday afternoon, people bump into each other, elbow each other, it's impossible to move fast. You, got, yeah. you really literally got stuck in a crowd. Yeah. This is what happens in normal matter. Yeah. Electrons and particles collide, bump into each other. Right. But if you assume that by some mysterious phenomenon, all the people would now march in lockstep, would march in unison, oh, I see. then the people can move much, much faster because they are no longer bumping into each other. Okay. And this state of marching in unison 
moving in a synchronized fashion, this is the distinguishing feature of a superconducting or supercooled state. Oh, okay. And do you anticipate uh, room temperature superconductivity, or, or is that never going to happen? Well, we have come quite far from close to zero Kelvin now to, uh, to temperatures of uh, around the boiling point of liquid nitrogen, mm -hmm. which is much, much higher. If we can do the next big step to room temperature, nobody knows. All bets are off. All I can say is there is no law of physics which says that it's impossible. Really? Okay. And unless it's proven to be impossible, researchers have to try. I have to keep searching. And what, uh, it's ridiculous, but question, I suppose, but uh, do you, is your hunch that that will be discovered, say, you know, within your lifetime? Or is it just ridiculous to even ask that question? I don't have any hunch because mm. that really depends on, you can say, disruptive technology on a discovery of probably a new class of materials. Right. But the example is the discovery of high TC superconductors in 1987, where more recently people discovered the so called ion based superconductors. Uh, Nobody expected that. It just came okay. out, for, at least for me, it came out of the blue. Yeah. So it shows there is enough richness in materials that there are still some stones which have not been turned okay. around. Okay. And so it clearly shows that the field has still the potential for unexpected discoveries. Okay. Okay, let me ask you another question, which <clears throat> I'm sure many people have asked you, is why is it impossible to reach absolute zero, even though you can go down to millionths of a degree above absolute zero. What well, is it meaningless to talk about absolute zero? Or no, it's very yeah. meaningful yeah. because absolute zero is defined as the temperature where there is no energy left. For the scientist, I would say no free energy left, but I'm not going to explain the difference between energy and free energy. Okay. Yeah. And that means that in a gas, if there is no kinetic energy left, everything comes to a standstill. Okay. So this is absolute zero. So absolute zero is very well defined as the point where things come to a standstill, there is no energy left in the system. Okay. But now the question is, why can't we never reach it? Well, for uh, what happens is the following. If you, if you approach absolute zero, everything moves slower and slower. Yeah. If you go 10 times closer to absolute zero, at least in a classical gas, uh, everything would be three times slower. The velocity is, uh, slows down. Yeah. But if you cool the gas, it takes longer and longer to cool because the heat which has to be transported out of the system, uh, this transport of heat also occurs at a slower and slower rate. Right. So therefore you can say, uh, when you reach, we have reached now nano Kelvin, or in some example, in some cases even uh, pico Kelvin temperatures. Wow! <laughs> so if you want to so go, so pico is that a billionth of a degree? Pico or uh, a nano is a billionth, and pico okay. is a thousand times less. A ten to the minus twelve. Wow! Okay. Pico Kelvin is wait, what comes next? Trillions. Yeah, trillions. It's a millions times a millions. <laughs> it's incredible. Okay. Uh, so, so what happens is. Closer you come, the slower you have to proceed. Okay. So it may take us, uh, you know, seconds to cool to nano Kelvin. Then it takes us minutes to cool to pico Kelvin. It may be hours and such. So you can come closer and closer, but you have to be more patient and more patient. Right. But to literally reach absolute zero takes an infinite amount of time. Okay. So it's a, it's a, it sounds. I mean, I'm. I'm Thinking it's like the speed of light. It's 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 a kind of it's a kind of absolute limit that you can approach, but you can never. Yeah, you can approach reach. it arbitrarily close, but yeah. there is nothing mysterious about it. It's just the nature of a limit that uh, there are mechanisms built into uh, the laws of physics that the closer you come to the limit, the harder it becomes. For instance, if you reach the speed of light, uh, the particle becomes heavier and heavier due to the increase of kinetic energy and if you want to 
accelerate a little bit more, you need more and more force. Yeah. And at the limit of the speed of light, it takes an infinite force. Yeah. So it's just this way how you approach the limits, yeah. which says it, there is nothing mysterious. You can come closer, 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 but you have to work harder, harder, harder to get there. Okay. But the, uh, the fact of absolute zero temperature there shouldn't be any mystery about it. There's nothing mysterious. It just means like an emptiness, an emptiness of energy. Okay. So if I ask you, you have a vacuum chamber, can you reach absolute zero pressure? Can you reach a condition that your vacuum chamber is completely empty? And can you? Well, I'm asking you. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, you would say in principle, yes, I just yeah. pump out the gas. Yeah. But then what happens is, there may be a few molecules left which move very, very slowly. It takes longer to pump them out. There may be some molecules which sit on the surface and are then released. Yeah. So ultimately, yeah. you cannot make it completely empty because to do a perfect job to hunt for the last few molecules of gas would just take you forever. I see. Yeah. So just to create an empty chamber where there is no particle left, you can get closer and closer, but you will probably never get it absolutely empty. Yeah. And similarly, absolute zero temperature is complete emptiness of energy. Mm. And it's just, you can say, you, you can get something empty, but if I ask you, well, you can clean out something, but you go a factor of 10, another factor of 10, another factor of another factor yeah. of 10, and it gets increasingly harder and harder. Yeah. And even if I would ask you to, you know, find the last piece of dust in this room, <laughs> and you make this air completely dust-free, yeah. you can go better, 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 but you will never reach absolute zero in forms of dust concentration. No. And, okay. and, we, and of course, with temperature, it's a more fundamental law, and people have expressed it in the third law of thermodynamics, which says that uh, which is very which says mathematically why it's impossible to reach absolute zero but it's nothing else than it gets harder and harder to get the last little bit of energy out of the system all right now um, <clears throat> okay I'm going to ask you about the Bose Einstein condensate is that right sure yeah yes. okay so again I don't really under no I absolutely do not understand what that is um, but if you could give me some, it's a state of matter. Yeah. How how many states of matter are there? I mean, we've got the, f the three that we're familiar with: solid, liquid, and gas. But sort of, yeah. But I mean, how is is that as as different a state of matter as they are from each other, or is it is it kind of more like a gas? Or I would refer to superconductors and superfluid as the fifth state of matter, but. Let me first say, there are many, many forms of matter with dramatically different uh, qualities, qualities oh. in their behavior. Oh, many. And, mm. and it's sometimes, some people want to catch attention and say, this is not just a novel form of matter, it's a new state of matter. A new state means a major form of matter. Okay. So historically, we have distinguished between solid, liquid, and gas, but then people found that if you heat up a gas to very high temperature and it becomes a plasma, a plasma of positively and negatively charged particles, that it has behavior which is so different from gases that they said plasma is the fourth state of matter. Okay. And is that a sudden transition? It suddenly goes from gas into plasma at a certain temperature, does it? No, or is it a, there no? is no phase transition. No. Uh, if you increase the temperature of a gas, you will find that the equilibrium shifts more and more from neutral atoms to ionized atoms. Oh, okay. And uh, it, it's more crossover. Okay. Uh, okay, now with uh, superfluids, there are, there are materials, there is matter in nature, which are superfluid and superconducting, and they are characterized by what I described earlier, that all the particles march in locksteps, are synchronized. Right. More deeply, it means they act as one big wave, and it's a quantum mechanical wave. This okay. is actually responsible for this synchronized behavior. And I would uh, share the point of view of Fritz London, who did his pioneering work in the 30s and 40s, that those superconducting and superfluid 
forms of matter deserve to be grouped together as a novel state of matter. I see. So the superconductors, the superfluids, or that's another technical word, phenomena which are based on a macroscopic quantum state of matter. Okay. And I would call this the fifth state of matter. All right. And that is, um, so you started talking about superfluids and superconductors when I'd mentioned Bose-Einstein condensates. Are they the, the same Bose thing? Bose-Einstein condensate <laughs> is, is the first example of a gas which is superfluid. Okay. But there are people who would have said this, the con Bose-Einstein condensate alone is now a new form of matter. Well, everybody is entitled to his or her opinion, but I would say there are sufficient similarities to superconductors and to superfluid helium that I would not set the Bose-Einstein condensate apart as its own state of matter. I know. would rather group it together with other superfluids and superconductors. Okay. Do, um, are you ever concerned about uh, how your research will enter the practical world or do you not worry about that at all? Is that someone else's problem? Do you just do pure research and, and that's all you're concerned about? Uh, I'm definitely concerned about applications. Yeah. And for me, one fascination of my research is that we are dealing with the real matter. Mm. Uh, in our field, there are lots and lots of theoretical suggestions how matter could behave if the particles had those and those properties. But usually people are getting much more excited if those proposals can be realized in nature. So there is a fascination in my field and a fascination for myself if something is real. And that means it can be done with real particles in the laboratory and not just as a theory on a piece of paper. Okay. So I'm definitely concerned and I'm really also fascinated by what can we do in the real world. Okay. Of course, what I call real means matter close to absolute zero at a few nano Kelvin, and it is very far away from the world around <laughs> us yeah. where applications happen. Yeah. But I'm still motivated by the fact that what we learn, what we discover in the ultra cold regime, in the over the next years or decades, people may repeat may may repeat this phenomenon at room temperature in other materials. Yeah. So in other words, what we find is we find the mechanisms in nature and the low temperature allows us to see them more clearly. Yeah. But once we know what nature has made possible, other people, material the developers, uh, material research can find other ways to implement those mechanisms. So in other words, yes, we are hoping that our research can discover what may turn out the blueprints of new devices, of new materials, of new superconductors. Yeah. Uh, so that motivates me, but I'm not worried that the time lag between our discoveries and devices in the real world may be several decades. Right. I'm here for the long haul. <laughs> and do you have a, have a sense of a pressure from the outside world that what you're doing should have a practical application or, or does that not happen to you? You don't have people saying, well, why haven't you put this into practice yet? You know, why aren't we getting free I don't, electricity? I don't or... feel the pressure, no. but I think there is a legitimate interest and in, interests. How does your research connect to the real world? Mm -hmm. And I've often explained people that we are, un, we are unraveling uh, the mechanisms which make matter behave as it behaves. We are finding out what makes superconductors superconducting, what makes superfluid superfluid. Mm -hmm. and, and this definitely relates to the real world. Mm -hmm. But we need people who look at it in the very fundamental way mm -hmm. because they think more out of the box. They, uh, they, they work on curiosity-driven research. Uh, we need those people in addition to material designer who work on a much shorter term with respect to applications in the real world. Mm -hmm. And usually people understand it. Yeah. So I don't feel any pressure to change my research or to work on what people call more applied research. 
uh, I rather take it as an opportunity to explain that we need both. Yeah. We need fundamental research, which use, which looks out, which looks for major new discoveries, for things which are just off the charts. Mm -hmm. But we also need people who take those ideas and bring and, and introduce them into real materials. Yeah. Now, you just said you're in, in this for the long haul. Do you imagine ever retiring? Do you look forward to retirement? Or do you think, oh, I'm always going to be working on this? Well, I'm in my early 50s. It's too early to think about <laughs> it. But I do think there will be a natural time where you should change the pace of life. Yeah. Where, as a researcher, you should realize that the research, the progress in your field is driven by younger people. And maybe it's time for you to transition to other, you know, activities in life. And that could naturally lead to retirement. <laughs> I, 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 not in the near future, though. Well, I'm, no, I'm not thinking about it in the no. near future, but I no. could very well imagine that uh, there is a reasonable age yeah. where people should retire because yeah. that's the nature of life. There is a, a bit of a cliche or stereotype that all the great discoveries are made by scientists in their 20s or something like that. Do you, do you feel that you were, that in your 20s, you ha were having the most innovative thoughts or insights, or do you feel that that's carried on all through your life so far? Well, uh, the, the discoveries I'm famous for, uh, I made them when I was in my late 30s or, mm -hmm. or early 40s. Okay. So, so relatively recently, really. So in that sense, it's yeah. relatively recent. And uh, you also have to factor in as an experimentalist, you can often do better work if you have more experience. Yes. So I think there is something which maybe compensates for, um, for maybe the loss of sheer creativity. Oh, yeah. People say that for mathematicians or theorists, it's different because for them it's all brain power. Okay. For an experimentalist, we, we actually have to be multi-talented yes. to run a research group, to organize labs and such. Yeah. And I sometimes think I'm still improving in some regards Good. the way how I conduct research. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, I, I would be happy to accept uh, that I have already made my most important discoveries yeah. and I may not be able to compete with uh, the impact of the discoveries I made uh, in the 95 and 96 yeah. and 97. Yeah. On the other hand, I feel what I'm doing is really relevant. It, it has impact it's still on worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had eureka moments when you suddenly have an insight to what's going on or what you need to do? Or, or is it always a gradual build-up and then a, an understanding do you understand what I mean? There are definitely moments where you say, now I start, I, I've understood something. But often the understanding comes by sitting, reading papers, scripting some equations or such. It's not that the idea is sort of born out of nothing. Mm. It's like if you want to solve some equations, you try out how the different pieces fit together, you try to solve an equation in this way or that way, and suddenly you understand it and you see the solution. Yeah. And that can also happen when you think about how to uh, take matter into a new regime. Suddenly you have an idea how laser beams, magnetic field and all that, how you can arrange them in a new combination and that realizes a new form of matter. Okay. It was interesting when you were talking about playing with the equations, it looked like you were playing the piano. And it <laughs> reminded me of when I'm trying to get an idea at the piano. <laughs> I just let the fingers do the work sometimes. Um, yeah, there may be some <laughs> It's really sort of playing around, exploring yeah. it, turning things around and understanding them. Yeah. And often the idea which emerges is so simple that you say, well, this is so simple, I didn't need all those complicated thoughts, but it is only by exploring a much richer, a much more complicated, you know, range of possibilities that suddenly you have the simple idea. Okay. And sometimes when you explain the simple idea to other people with a clarity, they say, well, it's so simple, why didn't we get it? Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it happens again and again that 
the simple discoveries are often made by the people who considered a much more complex range of possibilities. Yes. Okay. And do you, are, are you do you take a strong interest in other areas of science, or are you really quite focused on your own area? Would you say? I, I would say both. I'm naturally curious. Mm. I. I like to read about discoveries in other fields of physics or other fields of science. Yeah. It's just fascinating to see mm. new ideas, how they emerge. Mm. But I have to say, uh, sometimes it's a self-imposed restriction. I would like to read much more about it mm. and learn much more details about those breakthroughs. Mm. But then I have to say, well, if I spread myself too broadly, I can't make a difference in my own field. Yeah. So being a researcher who wants to have an impact on his field, you have to keep a focus. Yeah. Now you're a runner. What do you think about when you're running? It might be nothing. Oh, well, <laughs> it depends. In the early phase of running, it's relaxing. Your ideas roam around. You think about things at work. You think about things about your family or about your life. But eventually, when you get more and more tired, you're more thinking about... <laughs> How, it, how great it will feel to reach the goal. <laughs> to stop running. <laughs> to stop running and just feel this deep satisfaction which comes when you have, uh, when you have you know, reached a goal in physical exercise. Right. But you're not, you're, you, you haven't got a cloud of equations filling your mind when you're running. No, actually to think about equations and to think logically and analyze something uh, takes an effort. Yeah. And if your body uses the effort, if your body uses the energy to run, yeah. I can't think about very complicated things. No, no. People often ask me if I go for a walk in a lovely countryside, they say, oh, I expect you get inspired. And I say, no, I don't. I just go for a walk and enjoy the scenery. I never think about music when I'm, when I'm in that sort of setting. I, I, th I think a run can purify your thought. Uh, usually after run, I feel great, and I can sit down and then work on something. And really focus on something. But yeah. or during a run, you can sometimes, if you if you had a you know busy agenda and there are so many things you think you have to do, you can sometimes sort out things while you're running. Yeah. But a deeper logical analysis takes a focused effort, and you can usually focus only on one thing. Yeah. So you can't focus on both running and solving a problem. Yeah. Is it, this might be a difficult question to summarise in a couple of sentences, but what, what, what right now is taking, taking most of your attention in your work? Well, right now we are interested in magnetic ordering in in, you can say, magnetic forms of matter, which show special magnetic properties. Mm. And to realize those magnetic materials using ultra-cold atoms requires lower temperatures than have currently been achieved. So I'm thinking actually mm. a lot about how can we play tricks with those atoms to make them even colder. Wow. <laughs> so we want to penetrate from nano-Kelvin to pico-Kelvin. And... You have to think hard about it, what tricks you can play with the atoms to make this happen. And you actually need those lower temperatures to do this, this research. There are forms of matter which will only exist at lower temperatures. I mean, let's face mm. it, mm. If, you live in a if you live in a desert where it's really hot and you want to do research on ice or snow, <laughs> if you don't build a refrigerator, you can't do it. <laughs> yeah. And similarly, if we don't build a refrigerator for pico-Kelvin temperatures, there are certain forms of matter which we just can't produce. And how, again, very briefly, how do you reach those very low temperatures? I mean, is it, are they just super refrigerators or are they working in a completely different way? From They work in a very different way. In, uh, our refrigerators use actually the tools we are using, the tools how we can manipulate, how we can access how we can, so to speak, talk to the atoms. I mean, how do you talk to an atom? Mm -hmm. well, with a laser beam, with a magnetic field, with a microwave, with a radio frequency. So it's these forms of radiation which allow us to 
move the atoms around and and stop them moving and stop them moving yeah, yeah sometimes you want and to track you want to do something that when they, they move they feel an opposing force and come to a standstill right. or sometimes you want to sort the atoms out that the atoms which move fast you want to get rid of them and just keep the ones which move slowly right. and that's colder and colder yeah and so it's this kind of, of combinations and and so you you have to apply everything you know about atoms to you have to be creative with your tools to put them together but all our refrigerators consist of you know vacuum chambers with atoms and then in a very skillful way we arrange different laser beams different magnetic fields microwaves and all that and eventually this takes the atoms down the temperature scale okay hopefully even closer to absolute zero <laughs> than before exciting stuff that's amazing. Thank you very much. Yeah, You're welcome. Really please. interesting. Really interesting. I hope it just carry. I hope it did carry on recording. Uh, sure, it did. Yeah, we've done just over half an hour. Brilliant. Okay.